for you. Let's hand over to Claire Hubbard from the Met Office. And I'll let you take it away. <laughs> Good afternoon. So um, I'm Claire Hubbard. Um, I'm actually the data policy manager at the Met, Met Office. Uh, but the reason that um, I'm talking this afternoon is because one of the big things that I've been doing over the last 18 months or so is looking at open data and trying to get our data out there in, in open formats and, and where we're going from there. So um, I'm going to do a little bit of um, kind of where we've come from, why we've done it, where we are now, and then where we're going to in the future. So where do we start? Well, um, the Met Office has been utilising the latest technology um, from the very early days. So uh, back in 1873, the latest technology was telegraphs. Um, and so weather data was being passed around um, between countries um, from, the, from very early days. Um, and a lot of the drive for us for sort of what we're doing with data is about exchanging it and sharing it with other people. So, this was back in 1873, and we've got a little bit more modern now. So we now have satellites. So this is our kind of our, our manufacturing process, we refer to it. We have satellites and radars and um, stations um, bringing in all the observations. What is the, the weather like now? Uh, we have a little bit of science um, and some calculations. Um, and then we have a rather large supercomputer working at 1.4 petaflops, which is a thousand trillion calculations a second. So it's working quite fast. Um, that creates all the models. We start with a big global model. Uh, that then goes down into uh, a European-based model. Um, and as we go down the scales, we sort of chop the world up into to smaller bits. Um, and then we go down to the UK. And from that, we then do a bit of post-processing. So we have our own products that we create. Um, and the Met Office is a trading agency. So it's a government organization. But we have a remit to make money. Okay, So that's worth remembering when we start talking about open data and giving stuff away. So we actually have a, a commercial team. And their job is to create products using the weather data, uh, not just for creating the public task and your public forecasts and the, the BBC forecasts, but also for the utilities companies, uh, for the road users uh, and, and highways agency, do I grit the road when it's snowing, uh, those sorts of things, and, and lots of other services, defence, etc. Um, and then we have reusable data. Um, resolution 40, you may not be aware of, but that's a World Meteorological um, Organisation resolution, which says that we will share a certain amount of our data for free. Because we've been exchanging weather data with other people for quite a long time. Um, so we've got the World Meteorological Organization, and it's kind of neutral. So wars can happen, and we'll still exchange data. Um, I think it's the scientists at heart. You know, they, they, they want to exchange the data no matter what's going on. Um, and, and more lately, we've had UK Locations Program. Um, we're working um, on things like Inspire. Um, so we're always working, and obviously there needs to be standards. So we're working on how do we share our data easily with other people and keeping it up with the latest standards for sharing that, technology, uh, that data and using the latest technology. But with all of that, we've ended up, we've needed to go to open data. But we thought, well, actually, we don't just want to go to open data and go, here's a CSV. There you go, off you go. We said, well, actually, we need to do something a bit better than that. Because we need to do open data, but we don't just want to make it downloadable. We want to make it reusable. We want people that can reuse our data with their open source software um, and do stuff with it. If we're going to do it, let's, let's do it properly. Um, we also, wanted to we also wanted to maintain our position as the source of the data. We didn't want to become an intermediary, so somebody else taking these CSV files and reformatting them and then being the one that everyone went to for the data and us losing um, the kind of our position as, as being the national Met service. And we also wanted to give ourselves a platform for adding value because we do have a remit to make money and offset the costs of what we do. So we created DataPoint. Um, 
To work out what we were going to put on data point, though, we needed to think about what did open data mean for us. Um, and this took an awful lot of thinking about from quite a few senior managers within the office to come up with a set of criteria that we would use in order to work out what was open data. So we said, well, it's basically, it's got to be funded by our p public weather service customer group. We have a, a group of people that represent various parts of government and also the public um, to say what we should, as a Met Office, provide to the public. And that's our public task. Uh, so it's got to be funded by them. Um, it's got to be in the public interest. So there's no point making data available that actually nobody wants, because that would be a waste of money. Um, it needs to be in an agreed format. So the majority of our data is actually in XML, JSON, those sorts of things, things that we know that the developer community wants to be able to use it in. But the data volumes have got to be reasonable. There's no good putting out huge files of data that take you six hours to download when it's an hourly updated forecast. It really doesn't help anybody. Um, we also have to own the IPR. So we talked about all this data that we're taking in and sharing. Well, a lot of that we don't own the IPR for. So we need to make sure that if we're going to give it to somebody else under an OGL license, that we actually own that IPR to make it available to others. It's got to be operational, because actually the driver for data point was something that people could use to create commercial services on, and operational services, and make money out of using our data. That's what we really want to see. But if it's not an operational service, then actually you're not going to be able to create your commercial services off the back of it. And it's got to be consistent. We had a lot of complaints um, probably a couple of years ago when our forecasts and the BBC forecasts weren't the same, but they were the same data. So we need to make sure that whatever we're putting out there is consistent. So you don't go, well, I've got two data sets that you've provided, and actually they're not saying the same thing. Um, and we also needed to think about the cost um, and the opportunity cost. So we do have to think about what is the impact going to be on the Met Office as a whole um, if we make this data available for free. Um, and what is the cost of doing it? So um, we, we do need to think about how much development effort is required in order to do some of the work that we need to do. So, but we did eventually, after we locked them all in a room and said, you need to make a decision on this, we did actually get them to make a decision. And to a certain extent, what we said was, well, all the stuff on our website that you can go and look at and is weather information, that's pretty much our public task. That's the public data. So we'll start with that. So all the stuff in blue is all the data, all the web pages that the public tend to look at. And you can recreate those forecasts using the data from DataPoint. The only bits you can't have are some satellite project, products um, in terms of the scope. So we do provide satellite images, but not to a full European level, because we said we would keep it over the UK. Um, we have products from the Maritime Coast Guard Agency. We consider that their public task, not ours. But we are talking to them about actually making their products available through DataPoint. And then finally, our authoritative voice. So we have our national severe weather warnings. Um, so when you get the really heavy rain, etc. And we need to make sure that we've got consistent messaging. So we said we really can't have that as open data. We need to know who's reusing it um, and what they're doing with it and check that they're doing it properly and that they're updated in a timely fashion. So it's not that you can't have it, you just can't have it as open data because we won't necessarily know who you are. So that's where we started. Um, so we, we knew then what the data was, and then we went, well, well, how do you want it? So we've really had user engagement at the core of everything that we've done with DataPoint. So we started off with some requirements capture. Uh, we went out and we asked people. We went and saw the Ordnance Survey, because they'd done something similar with their open space. What did you want? Um, we know that they use our data. How do you want to use our data? We went and saw some um, app development companies. What would you like from something like this? Um, and we put some surveys out. And uh, we, we based, used our, that to, to define our requirements. Um, we now have a user forum. I, I use a Google group. Um, and it, it's sort of self-supporting. So they can ask each other questions. Um, they'll say, how do I use this map layer? Um, and somebody else will answer it. Um, I go in there. I help. But actually, we do actually have user-to-user -user support, so which is working really well. Um, we also have analytics, and I'll show you some of the, the, 
the numbers that we've had from, from monitoring who's using our data. So we use that to inform where we're going forward. Um, we obviously have the hackathons and, and those sorts of things, um, and we're talking to the users. So a uh, bit of a pitch, we're over in the corner of the coffee shop. It would be lovely to talk to the, you, some of you people because we're going to be doing some developments in the near future, and it would be great to hear what you'd like to see happening. So please come and have a chat. Um, so where are we now? Having done all of that, this is DataPoint. Uh, this is actually the catalogue for DataPoint. It's not actually the end, back end bit where you get the data. But what I've done recently is we've started to make it the place you go if you want Met Office weather data. So this actually sits on our RESTful web service. So there's data that sits behind us on a RESTful web service through an API. Um, but then we have our historic regional climate data. That's on another page within the website. But most of you probably wouldn't be able to find it even if you were looking for it and are highly unlikely to probably go and look for it because you just didn't know it existed. So what we're trying to do is have data point become the focal point for those people that want to access our data. In time, we're looking to put paid for data on there um, because there's some stuff that isn't part of the public task um, and that we've created separately. So this will be the place you come to go and get that data. So this is a... I'm going to stand over this side now. So these are some of our prod products. Um, we have the map layers. And you'll see there's no map. That's because you get to put the map that you want. Um, so, and then you can use whichever layers you want to overlay them to see what the weather is. So these are forecast map layers. Uh, we then have um, the XML for uh, daily site-specific forecast, uh, regional extremes, and those sorts of things. So, We've tried to make it flexible, and obviously it's the content that's on our website. Um, we've done no advertising of DataPoint, apart from things like the hackathons and, and those sorts of things. Really haven't told anybody about it. So when we went live in, December, in November 2011, um, there was a few people who knew about what we were doing. So we had 96 people who were registered for DataPoint. And to be honest, I think half of those actually worked for the Met Office because they'd heard all about it and so they wanted to find out what it was. So they all registered. Uh, however many months later, this month, I've just done the stats for this month, we now have 3,500 people registered as users of DataPoint data from all over the world. And you'll see that from the next slide. Of which, on average, there are 744 people actively downloading data within an hour. So each hour there's on average about 744 people actively downloading the data using the RESTful web services. Which for me is absolutely fantastic because you can see even from kind of October last year there were 42 people. So for me this is fantastic and there's been really no advertising on any sort of great scale. So each month I have a look at what's going on and what the statistics are. Um, so I can see the majority of what people use is our site-specific data. The last couple of months, there's been one individual who I think just counts code um, because he's completely skewed my results on, how, on who's using the observations layers, and this is rainfall radar layers. Um, and I've looked at the logs, and it's one person calling the data every minute, and they're only uploaded every 15. So... I think that's kind of skewed my results somewhat, so you can ignore most of that. Uh, the other one that's quite interesting is the other graph is actually by country. I actually have, I think there's around 42 different countries actively downloading data each month um, from all over the place, from Belarus, the Ukraine, China, Japan, um, and 450,000 downloads from America last month. So, you know, we've, it's, it's a worldwide thing. So that's one of the things that we've needed to be quite careful about with our open data. One of the key drivers was from government to generate UK economic growth. But actually, we're driving USA economic growth as well. So we, we do need to be careful about what data we put on there and whose economic growth we're actually encouraging. Um, these are a few examples 
um, of, of who's using our data. Um, I tend to do a bit of Google searching. It's usually a Friday afternoon thing that I do. A bit bored, what shall I do? I'll see if I can find out who's using our data. Because although you have to register to use DataPoint, I need a username, which could be Mickey Mouse, an email address, and that's it. So I can contact you, but I don't really know who you are, and I don't really know why you're using it. So some of these things I've just kind of found out about. Um, there's the Essex Weather. They do county-level weather forecasts. Uh, Forecast.io, which some of you might know about, that's quite a nice interface. Our um, IT director quite likes Forecast.io. Um, this one is one of my favourites because they're actually using Transport for London data as well. He's created himself a little barometer. He's set himself some thresholds of when he'll walk and when he'll take the tube um, and what the tube lines are like. And so he's taking their data as well. And the little barometer will tell him whether he should take his bike or whether he should go on the tube. So I quite like that one. And that one actually is open source code. He tells you how to make your own barometer with your Raspberry Pi um, and our data and TFL's data. So lots of different uses. And the odd one or two in here are actually charging for it, which is absolutely brilliant. OK. Um, we did some surveying recently because we wanted to show to our public weather service customer group that what we were doing was actually generating economic growth. So we did a bit of a customer satisfaction survey. Um, unfor for me, unfortunately, only 20% of the users of DataPoint that answered the survey said that they actually generated revenue, which, considering why we're doing it, was a little disappointing, but I'm sure that will improve. Um, but actually, what's really interesting is that, well, they actually are, they don't care, or they're very satisfied, satisfied. So actually, those that are using it to create revenue are happy with what we're doing, which is absolutely brilliant because it means I must have got something right. Um, we also use something called a Met Promoter Score. So you have a look at those people who would say, I would recommend you to a friend. Um, and of those, uh, the majority of those that are using it to generate revenue would recommend us as a, as a data provider to others of where they should get their data from, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, we also said, why have you started using it? Um, what industry you work in, and you can see that actually um, lots of different industries that they're working in. Some people have personal data, um, but if you look at those that are generating revenue, the app website development goes up to about 60%. So, you know, there, there's a lot of different industries. We have Drax Power Station using our data. I still haven't worked out why they're, what they're doing with it, but they are. Okay. One of the other things that we've been looking at is how do we brand our data or should we brand our data? At the moment, if you use DataPoint, you have to say that you're using government published information. Um, so we thought, well, actually, should we be saying that it's copyright or data provided by Met Office? Because Ordnance Survey, you have to say it's data provided by Ordnance Survey. Um, what was quite interesting is actually those who that are trying to generate revenue would actually like us to add the brand on. But the ones that are doing it for personal less so. So we're still in the balance of whether or not we'll do it on a request for basis. But again, if you have an opinion of whether you'd like, us, like to be able to use our brand um, and you think if you were going to use the data, then please come and see me and let me know. OK, so where are we going next? Well, as I said, we've been user engagement, these sorts of events, um, our survey that we did, um, industry standards. You know, we're, we're trying to work with industry standards and, and do what we should be doing with our data. Um, we have to meet Inspire as a government organisation. We have to be Inspire compliant, and we actually have to be Inspire compliant by December. So our developer teams are working very hard to make sure that they meet those deadlines. Um, and we've also been con con keeping records of incidents and known errors and users reporting issues with it. So we've collected all of that information, and from that, oh, so. Inspire is about, obviously, the discovery, the view, and the reuse and download. So we're doing stuff with our map players um, to turn them into web map tile services rather than just being the, the PNGs at the moment. So this is our data point release plan. So what we've done is we've said, right, OK, this is what we're going to be doing before Christmas, fingers crossed. Um, we're looking at being Inspire compliant, so we need to get our web map tile services. Um, we need to use UTF-8. I actually don't know what that is, but I'm told that's what we have to do. Um, additional map projections, so you can use different map players because you can only use one at the moment. 
Um, and then things like self-registration for service notices. Because I've got 3,000 registered users, but only 700 of them are actually using the data, they get a bit fed up when I send them lots of emails about the fact that there's going to be an outage or something's going to happen. So what we said was actually it'd be much better if you could just sign up to the notices yourselves. So that's going in, um, getting some decent error messages, that sort of things. Um, we're also going to tell you we do our mountain area forecast that's on our website. We're actually going to tell you what the area of the mountain is that we're forecasting for so that if you wanted to, you can replicate it. So there's lots of stuff that we're doing here to make the data more useful. Okay. And then over the next few months, we're going to be developing our requirements, the detailed requirements for doing some more work. And what we're now trying to do is to get ourselves into a rolling plan. So in the next few months, we'll start thinking about what we're going to do before Christmas next year. Um, so you can see we're looking at adding more data, um, increasing what's going on. So all the stuff that I said, will we point to stuff on, the, on other places in the website, that will again be moved over to data point, RESTful web services, web map tile services, those sorts of things to make the data more useful and make it more interactive with other data that other people provide. So... This is where we're going. The next big project, though, is our National Archive project. So um, we are a place of paper deposit for the National Archive. Um, and we need to become a place of electronic deposit, really, because we want to maintain being the source of the data. Um, and that means we need to provide people a way of getting to that electronic data rather than just archiving it. So we are actually in the process of collecting requirements. How do people want to be able to get at this data? What data do they want? What resolution? How quickly? And all those sorts of things. So again, if you wanted to come and talk to us because you want some historical weather data, then um, it would be really, really brilliant to hear from you. Any questions? Um, I'm just trying to see if any of my technical colleagues are in here. Um, I don't know. <laughs> However, if you see anybody with a Met Office badge around here, they're likely to know. Um, but I'm afraid I don't. Um, we have, we don't have daily rainfall amounts on there at the moment. Um, there's quite a lot of discussion about that. And one of the things is because we've been kind of maintaining what's on the website, um, we don't have any daily rainfall amounts on the website and therefore we don't have it on data point. Um, so it's, it's a bone of contention between the, we should be making data open for people to use and actually this is quite a highly valued amount. The other thing is, is because we're not the only ones that have daily rainfall amounts, it's obviously the, the Environment Agency have a huge amount of it as well. We need to be quite careful about, well, here's all of our data available for free, and then we effectively force their hand of what they need to do as well. So it's going to be a bit more work and sort of collaboration about how we do it. I mean, actually, ideally, you'd have a single data set that was made up of us, what we had, and the EA, and Northern Ireland Rivers Agency, and SEPA, and, and one single data set. So there's probably a little bit more work in there for that. Um, it, it's, it's push from government. Um, you must make your data openly available where it is public data. Um, we've probably spent more than we really needed to because we said if we're going to do it, we want to do it properly. 
and give ourselves a platform that we can then make that data, uh, you know, make some money out of it. Like the, you know, open source software is then about providing support. That's kind of what we've done. Um, but we do have a usage limit. So if you want to have more than 5,000 requests a day, then you pay a contribution. So it's about £1,700 a year. And you pay a contribution to the, the infrastructure and the networking that we'd need to put in place to, to stand up all that extra um, bandwidth that we would need. Thank you.